All right. Hey guys, welcome to the channel and welcome back to another video. Welcome to the channel and welcome back to another video. On this video, guys, we're going to be talking about 15 key clauses that should be in your landlord tenant lease. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into it, guys. I got a request for this information uh, from someone in my smart money, bro, maximize your money in your real estate Facebook group. So I said, let's do a video about this. Let's do it live and let's do it on YouTube. And let's talk about the types of things that need to go in every single landlord tenant lease that you have. Now, there's a lot of other things that I won't cover, but there's some really important things. These 15 should be in pretty much every landlord tenant lease. Now, let me preface this whole thing. If you're on IG, uh, live on IG, or if you're on YouTube, I'm not an attorney. I have owned and managed rental property for the last 22 years. And um, so I have done hundreds of leases, right? And I've owned and managed uh, multiple properties for lots and lots of years. But I also manage federal government contracts. So I manage those federal government contracts on behalf of the federal government. So I bring that up just to say that, you know, a lease is a contract. And so I've got some experience doing that. So that's kind of my background. But um, a lease is basically a legally binding contract between you as a landlord or property owner and a tenant. Um, so that's important to note. It's a contract. And uh, that's kind of the first thing I want to say about it is that a lease is an agreement to pay an owner for the use of an asset. We call that like a uh, consideration in contract law, basic contract law. Um, the lease is your agreement that you're going to pay them and you're going to pay them for the use of an asset. Now, in this case, when we're talking about rental property and rental houses, that asset is shelter, right? It's the property itself, the house, the apartment, et cetera. So the one thing I do want to tell you, if you're a landlord out there up front, I want to say is Always make sure you go over the lease with the tenant in full and in detail um, when they move in or prior to them moving in. Going over the lease emphasizes the lease. It lets the tenant know that you think the lease is super duper important and it's so important. You're going to take out 15, 20 minutes or so before they sign it to talk about it and what's in it so they know what's in it. In other words, if you're a landlord or a property owner, property manager, make a big deal out of the lease. And that way it sticks in the front of their mind as a tenant that you think the lease is important, um, very important. So your job also as a landlord, before I jump into the 15 things, I'm getting there. But your job as a landlord is to make sure you follow your lease to the T. Always follow your lease. All right. Don't waver. You can waver from your lease. Right. Do something different. But you want to focus real heavily on being pretty stern about that lease and revisit it once a year from time to time. If time, if you're re renewing the lease, go over it again. But the other thing is be sure that both parties, you and the tenant have a signed copy. But watch to the end. I'm going to give you 15 things. And of these 15 things, there's some must haves. And I think the last three or four of them are some of the key clauses that need to be in every single lease. But the other ones uh, are important as well. So pay close attention throughout the video. So um, some are obvious, some are not so obvious. So without further ado, let's just jump into it, guys. And if you happen to have a question, we, we're, we're live. If you have a question or so, just drop it in there. We'll answer it. If not, drop a comment below on YouTube and we'll go over this and we'll answer all your questions for sure. All right. So number one, the first thing that needs to be in every single lease from a landlord standpoint is the name of the tenants. Now, so this is pretty obvious, right? But the name of the tenants and the name of the landlord or the property owner, um, it's because the whole point of that is you, you got to identify who are the parties of the contract or the parties to the lease, right? So um, these are the people that are going to be liable for paying the rent and liable for taking care of the property and liable for all of the contents of the lease, Right. All of the clauses or things that are inside the lease that are spelled out, the people, the names of the tenant and the landlord are the responsible responsible parties. These are the adults. Now, if you got a five year old child. You don't have to necessarily name them uh, as the tenant. Right. Um, the second thing, number two, the second thing that every lease has to have is every lease has to identify 
the property. In other words, have the property address on there, the full address. OK, um, there might be, you know, the address might be 7221. There might be a lot of 7221s in your city. So you got to have the full address. What property are we referring to needs to be on the list? That's number two. Now, number three, the third thing that needs to be in every single lease is the terms of the tenancy or the terms of the agreement, the lease. And when I say anytime you hear the word term, we're talking about the time associated with it, right? How long? So how long is the lease? Six months, one year, whatever it may be, month to month, that needs to be on the lease, right? So the length needs to be spelled out clearly on the top of the lease somewhere in the beginning. Number four, the fourth thing that has to go on every single lease is the obvious elephant in the room, right? The amount of the lease, right? What is the amount of the rent and what is the due date of the rent? So the amount, so number four is basically all the money, right? Not all the money. We'll talk about the other one, but the rent amount, the due date that it's due, any particular late fees that are due. Again, money is the cons what we call the consideration in contract, basic contract law. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just telling you from years of having leases and many years of managing contracts for the federal government, consideration is important. And the money is consideration. And you got to have the money spelled out on the lease. Um, so, it also basically means what's being exchanged, right? What's what's the, the thing that's being exchanged that is of value in the eyes of the law? And that thing that's being exchanged, one thing is the money. The other thing is the shelter or the property. So that's those are things that are involved when we talk about consideration. Um, so that's very important. The money, how much is the rent, the due date of the rent, and any late fees that may or may not be applicable if the if the tenant doesn't pay on time, that's very important, has to be on the lease. Don't forget it. Um, let me say this real quick. Be sure this is important, too. I should have said this up front, but I should say it right now. Always, always, always landlords, property owners, property managers, always check your state specific laws, um, because every single state does things a little bit different when it comes to leases and and, uh, you know, landlord tenant leases, et cetera, landlord tenant laws, whatever that may be. Every state is a little bit different. What happens in Illinois is different than what goes on in Louisiana. What goes in Louisiana and Illinois don't really may not apply to Wyoming and Nevada and Maryland. Right. So you got to be checking. You got to know. So I would Google what are your Maryland state laws for landlord tenant and what does a Mar Maryland landlord tenant lease look like? What are the things that are that need to be on that? You can Google that for any state you're in. Every state is slightly, slightly, slightly different. All right. So you just got to be aware of that. I just want to stop and hold tight and don't go any further before I said that. Right. So number five, the fifth thing that needs to go on every single lease is about pets. OK, you got to spell out. You know, most people in America have pets, right? A lot of, I don't know what the numbers are, 60%. I'm guessing there. I'm thinking that's about right. You have to place something in your lease, not only if they have a pet, but what happens if they bring a pet on board, right? If they uh, go out and get a pet or if a pet is brought over to the house or brought to the premises, because it may not be their dog, Right. But it may be uh, the friend's dog or it may they may be house sitting for the grandson's dog or whatever it may happen. You would not believe how often that happens when you go to a property or you visit a property and all of a sudden or you call the person all of a sudden, roof, roof, you hear a dog in the back. Right. You didn't know they had a dog. So have something in the lease that talks about pets um, because you're going to get you're going to get it when a tenant says, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Yeah, I've got my. Uh, my daughter-in-law's uh, uh, German shepherd over here for the next couple of weeks. Right. And you're saying, OK, wait a minute now. What, what are we talking about here? So that's going to happen to you when you manage property. I guarantee you. Um, the other thing I want to mention real, real quick, guys, a quick interlude is, listen, I do I do one on one coaching and mentoring in the area of real estate and managing property. I'm going to drop that description on YouTube below. Check that out if you get a second. All right. Let's jump back in. Number six. The sixth thing, I'm giving you 15 of these. The sixth thing, sixth thing that you got to have on every single landlord tenant lease is you got to have 
the use of the premises on the lease. In other words, the property shall be used for residential purposes only. Um, if you don't want them using it for business, you need to say so in the lease and talk about the use of common areas. Oftentimes you might be uh, renting out an apartment. Uh, a, a common area is like your foyer of an apartment uh, building, or it might be the steps you know, of the apartment, but those are the common areas where everybody use. Everybody commonly gathers around. For some apartments, it may be the the laundry area in the basement or something like that. But you got to talk about what the use of the premises are so that everybody is, understands exactly what they can use their apartment or they can use their house for. Um, you know, so, you know, common areas and so forth, all that stuff needs to be exp explained. You're trying to protect your property as a landlord. And part of how you're protecting your property are the provisions and clauses and things that you put into the lease. Very, very important. So you have to spell these things out because your lease is a contract that can be used in the court of law. You got to realize that. All right. Now, number seven, the seventh thing that you got to make sure you include in every single lease is what's called an occupants clause. OK, the occupants clause is a clause that states who, what people uh, can occupy the residence, the premises, um, and they should be stated on the lease. Now, this again, now this is where your five-year-old and your 10-year-old and your 15-year-old come in, right? You can't, we can't form a lease with a five-year-old and a 10-year-old, right? But you can include them in the occupants clause that has a space on your lease where they name the people that can be living in the property. Now that should be spelled out again, and it needs to clearly point out the people's full government name. All right. Now I, I always do first, middle, last name of every single child or person that's living in the property. That's going to be included in a space on my lease where we can write all of those names in there. And it may change from time to time. Right. So those are the people that are legally based on the contract allowed to live in the property. Again, it's always a contention, a point of contention when you have rental property, because you're going to be visiting the property or something's going to come up where you got to go over there and you're going to see people all over the property and they may not be on the lease. OK, and that's part of what you got to deal with as a landlord or property manager. All right. So that's number seven, the occupant clause. Now, number eight, number eight is on the lease. You need to have who's responsible for what? Who's responsible for what repairs and what maintenance? If you as a landlord are going to be responsible for taking care of the lawn care, then you need to put that in the lease right there. If the tenant is responsible for, um, um, you know, whatever the tenant's responsible for, it could be a whole bunch of things. Whatever you're responsible for, what the tenant's responsible for and maintaining, spell it out in the lease. OK, uh, very important that you do that. All right. Very uh, important. All right, let me go check out something real quick, guys. Okay, perfect. All right, good. All right, so number nine, the ninth, I'm giving you 15 of these, right? Number nine is security deposit. Information, a clause about the security deposit should be on there. Now, when it comes to secure the, the, the details of security deposits, Every state is a little bit different. Every state can be different. You know, some states give you 30 days to return a deposit. Some states give you 15. Some states give you 60 days. But you need to include the clause about security deposits and make sure the amount of the deposit is listed on the lease. This is the other money piece that's, that doesn't go along with what I mentioned earlier. But you got to have the amount of the security deposit listed on the lease and the rules by which you are going to return the security deposit. That's why you got to know what your state specific rules are. Because again, every single state is different. All right. Hey, also, if you're on YouTube and you're getting anything at all of value out of this video, smash the like button, share it with who needs to know it, who needs to see it. Um, you know, subscribe if you're not a subscriber on YouTube. And then also do me a favor and drop a comment on YouTube as well. I want to know, you know, kind of what are some other clauses or things that you as a landlord like to see in your leases, like to put in your leases? All right, let's get back to number 10. Now, these last five are pretty important. So I really want you guys to focus on these. Number 10 is this. In every single lease, you need to have an inspection 
and access to premises clause. You need to be able to get into the property, view the property, you know, based on whatever your state says is the legal amount of time you're supposed to give a tenant the time to get into a property, 24 hours, 48 hours, 12 hours, whatever it may be. Now, you also need to include that time frame for entry on your lease. So it's the inspection clause. It says I have, you know, the landlord has a right to enter the premises to blah, 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 and must give a 24 hour notice. So you need to be able to inspect your properties and have access to the property. Check the rules in your state. Could be 24 hours, could be less, could be more. But all of that has to be spelled out in the lease. Very, very important. Now, number 11 is one you probably have not heard of. Number 11 is what they call the severability clause. Now, the severability clause is basically, it basically says this. If any part of the lease is deemed or considered to be illegal or unenforceable, or the judge says a part of your lease is not applicable, doesn't apply doesn't work here. Then the severability clause says the rest of the lease is still legally binding and valid, even though that portion may not be enforceable or may not be legal. So the judge says, hey, this number eight and nine you have on your list is something that is not legal in this state of uh, in this state of Texas or whatever. Right. The judge throws out that stuff in your lease. But the because the other clause, the severability clause is in there, the judge doesn't throw out the whole lease, only that little piece right there. So the severability clause is pretty important. And I think it's pretty, um, I say universal, but I think it's, I think almost every state would allow you to put a severability clause in the lease. But again, you got to check on that. You want to have a several mobility, severability clause in there. All right. Now, another one, number 12 is one that um, you may have not heard of, maybe you have, but you need to have every single lease needs to have what's called a, a transferability clause or some places, some uh, legal terms uh, would call it an assignable assignment clause or a sublease clause, right? So in other words, what this is, it says you can or cannot assign your contract to a third party. In other words, I'm a tenant and I'm living in some this person's house and I want to, you know, I'm moving to another state, but I have a friend and I just want to assign the lease over to him or sublet it out to him. So this clause spells out whether or not a tenant can transfer their position in the in the contract to somebody else or assign it to somebody else. Right. So very important clause to have in there. Now, if you allow that, then you want to allow it in the clause. If you don't allow it, then you want to make sure you say that it's this contract or this lease is not assignable um, or it's not transferable or subleases are not allowed. However you want to put it, but you got to have this type of clause in the in there. All right. Because it does come up. People move for all types of purposes to know other cities and so forth. And sometimes this is a way for them to get out of having to. Um, you know, break their lease or have this on their record, they just assign it to a friend or somebody that's still living in the city or wants to live there. Got to have a, a what we call a transferability or an assignment or a sublet or sublease clause. And these could be three separate types of clauses. I'm just kind of bunching them all together because they're similar. OK, on this on this uh, video for you guys. All right. Number 13, 14, 15, very important as well. All right. These are clauses that need to go in every single lease. Number 13, I'm looking at the comments here. Or any comments? Number 13 is the joint and severability or joint and several, not severability. I've said it wrong. The joint and several liability clause, the joint and several liability clause. Now, what this clause says is that each adult is responsible for the full amount of the rent and fulfilling everything inside this lease. Um, so each adult is responsible for damages, all right? Each adult is responsible for the rent. Um, each adult is responsible for all of the things laid out in the lease or the contract, right? This cuts out the whole deal of, well, I paid my portion of the lease and now so-and-so needs to pay their portion of the lease. It kind of cuts out the separation of responsibilities. Now, for, for a lot of you, this may never come into play. It's always good to have in your lease, though. It really comes into play in things like college towns where you have, you know, 
uh, different adults living in the property. You know, you might have three or four young men or young ladies living in the property and they all have separate responsibilities for paying the rent. But that's not really your issue. You just want to collect rent. So you want to have this joint and several liability clause in your lease that says, OK, so what if that person didn't pay? The whole rent is due. I don't care how I get it from who I get it. Right. So anyway, that very important clause to have in your lease. Now, number 14 is the terminating uh, the lease and the renewals clause. So in other words, this clause is what under what conditions or circumstances is a tenant permitted to break a lease early before the year is up or before the six month is up. Right. What are the conditions that have to take place it could be you could it could be two conditions. It could be 10 conditions. But you can always, again, check your state laws on this. But you could you want to have those things and conditions laid out in the lease. So everybody is clear up front about terminating the lease and about how the renewals are work. work. Is it going to be after one year? It's going to turn automatically into a month to month. Is it after one year? The lease will definitely not renew. They have to sign a new lease. You have to spell that out in your lease. Very important because it makes everything clear and upfront. And again, you're going to or you need to make sure you are enforcing the, the lease to the T. Do as be as 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 focused on that as possible. Right. Don't waver from 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 actually enforcing the lease. There may be times where you change some things or you make some adjustments after the first year when you go to renew whatever it is. But you know, you're enforcing the lease of team. Now, number 15 is it probably should have been number one. OK, number 15 is very important. It probably could have been number one. So number 15 is this. All right. And you'd be surprised at how many people overlook this one. Right. But you must have both parties sign the lease in pretty much every state. Right. If you don't have them sign the list and you don't have a copy of the sign uh, a, a agreement or sign contract, then in a lot of cases, the, 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 the lease is null and void because there's not signatures. And it sounds very basic and simple, but this is a piece that sometimes get, sometimes gets missed. I read a lot of you know cases and stories about uh, landlord tenant laws and stuff throughout the country. But anyway, the point is, is that if, it, if you want it to be valid and you want it to be enforceable, your signature as the landlord that has your name at the front, it, you need to sign it and date it. And then the tenant needs to sign and date it. OK, and then what I normally do is before a tenant moves into a property, we sit down face to face. OK, because I'm a, I'm a landlord that I manage my own properties. And so I don't do things like the large property management companies or stuff like that, or somebody that's managing the property from California. And now they're over in, uh, you know, um, Tennessee managing a property long distance. or they have a property manager. I sit down face to face with a potential tenant and we go over the lease line by line to make sure they understand it. And I have two copies with me. So I don't have to go make copies and all that stuff. I don't want to have to email them a copy. I, you know, I don't do any of that. I do it face to face old school. And so what happens is they sign two copies. They sign my copy. They sign their copy. I sign my copy. I sign their copy. I hand it over to them and we go over it. I tell them to put it in a safe space because I'm going to follow that lease to the T. I'm not going to waver. If When the late fees are due, the late fees are due. We're going to go ahead and follow it to the letter. And it's a contract between me and you. And if something happens where our relationship breaks down and we have to go to court, I'm going to use this lease to go to go to court with. I let them know that up front. Right. The one thing about being a, a landlord or property managers, you just be upfront and honest and frank with people and you be do it in a nice, kind way. Right. And you treat people kind and all that stuff. But you're honest with them up front and people respect that. OK, so there's other things that go into a lease besides these 15 things. Um, but again, Check out your state specific landlord laws, landlord tenant lease laws and the information that they have, because I just gave you 15 must haves. But there's some other little caveats and things that should be in there as well. The other thing I want to point out to you guys is this. When you create a lease, I don't care if you've already created a lease and you already have five or 10 or 30 or 100 properties. I would always have a, for a new lease, have an attorney 
review in your state who knows the state laws, who knows the residential real estate laws, have that attorney review your lease. Um, it just makes sure everything's up on the up and up and you got everything you need and, and, uh, with consideration to your state. And then again, once you have an attorney, it might cost you three, four, five hundred dollars, but it might be three, four, five hundred dollars that could save you three, four, five, ten thousand dollars down the road. Right. Listen, this was a short video. If you're live on IG, if you're live on your on YouTube, short video for you guys just to say, hey, these are 15 things that need to be included in every single lease that you do. Right. And again, check out what the state specifics are. But if you got any value at all out of these 15 quick things, um, out of this information, do me a favor, smash the like button, subscribe if you're not already a subscriber, and also drop me a comment, guys. Let me know some things that you've included in your leases that you think is a good idea for others to know. Drop that in YouTube if you can, guys, when you check this video out. All right. Listen, take care of yourself. Take care of other people. And I'll wrap to you guys on the next video. All right. Peace.